there you go. We're talking about the discovery of gold in California in 1848, right after the Mexican-American War, gold is discovered. We already know that the San Francisco 49ers, the NFL franchise in San Francisco, is named after those gold seekers, the 49ers. The population in California exploded. Everybody was going to make their weight in gold. Every boat that landed in San Francisco Harbor in Los Angeles, any place in California, automatically became a ghost ship because the entire crew would jump overboard and attempt to strike it rich somewhere in Northern California. Uh, after the gold was discovered in Sutter's Mills, uh, you're going to have immigration, uh, and I'm saying, I should say emigration within the country, jumping over the rest of the uh, Mexican session territory and right into California. So by 1850, she's already to become a state. And while that issue is burning before us, now you've got the election of 1848. And in that election, you've got a slaveholder and former hero of the Mexican-American War representing the Whig Party, and that is Zachary Taylor. And representing the Democrats, Lewis Cass. Now, of course, the South is ecstatic that Taylor is running. He's from Virginia, he's a slaveholder, and they feel that they're gonna get then California as a slave state, as long with the rest of the territory, and he will protect slavery. Wrong, because immediately when he gets elected, he vows that slavery shall not be extended into the territories. Well, this shocks uh, his supporters in the South, along with a number of other people who expected directly the opposite. This opens the era known as the fiery 50s. The 1850s will be event after event, body blow after body blow, leading us right into the Civil War. There was no break from it. And one of the things dealing with the problem of California and the newly acquired uh, poison pill, as one transcendentalist author described the Mexican territory as, into this fray steps the great compromiser. That, of course, being Henry Clay, the man who gave us the Missouri Compromise, the man who worked out the problems between Calhoun and Jackson over the uh, tariff of abominations, and now he steps into the battle one more time. His proposal is as follows. California enters in as a free state. The Mexican Cession Territory would be open to popular sovereignty. In other words, Congress would not determine free or slave. It would be the votes of the people within each individual territory thereby giving everybody uh, on its face a 50-50 chance. The end of the slave trade in Washington, D.C., but not the end of slavery, just the slave trade. You had slaves being auctioned within a block of the Capitol building, the uh, architectural hom homage to democracy. The putting into effect of a stricter fugitive slave law than the one that was already there. This one said that the Northern states and their local authorities had to cooperate and help apprehend fugitive slave laws. Really not much different with current situation with ICE going after immigrants and now Trump claiming that local authorities have to help them. And of course, we already have the controversy over sanctuary cities and, and so on. Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, uh, an ardent abolitionist, throws his weight behind these proposals. It will cost him his job in the Senate because it goes against what the people in the state believe, but he is putting country over state. Now, what happens is this. 
together, the compromise of 1850 is going to fail. But a gentleman by the name of Stephen A. Douglas is going to enter in. Not much is men mentioned uh, about him in this particular role. We all know about John C. Calhoun and uh, his, his role in this, okay? And once again, the, the South is threatening to secede. Uh, there you see a proposal by uh, one individual that we should have two presidents, one North and one South. So the sectionalism and the gap between the sections is growing more and more. Webster, we talked about, uh, eventually throwing his weight behind it. Clay uh, presents the Great Compromise, but Douglas realizing that it wouldn't pass because in every case, each one of the things that was part of the compromise had people opposed to it. So when you put all those things together and then you put all the people that are opposed to it, it's not going to pass. So what Douglas does is this. He is going to separate them so that each one of the proposals is voted on individually. And in each case, there was not enough opposition to them as individuals to warrant their defeat. And so as separate entities, they will pass, whereas they would not have passed if they stayed as one, as Henry Clay had proposed. So it's Douglas who's responsible for shepherding this through Congress. The Compromise of 1850 works. Now, I should point out that prior to it, one of the people opposed to this was Zachary Taylor, because Taylor said, if it gets to my desk, I'm vetoing it, simply because I will not allow slavery to extend. Fortunately, I guess you could say, he dies, and his place will be taken by Millard Fillmore. Fillmore, from the state of New York, uh, is going to approve of the compromise. So without the death of Taylor and the ascension of Fillmore from vice president into the presidency, none of this would have worked. So the compromise of 1850, California is a free state, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado are all open to popular <laughs> Now, understand something. The South knows that those territories will not vote for slavery. But as long as the opportunity was there, which removed the government, the national government from the equation, that meant that the South could still rest easy, that its peculiar institution would not be interfered with. Once again, another settlement called the Compromise of 1850 averted a civil war. The Compromise of 1850 admitted California as a free state. Utah and New Mexico territories were allowed to vote on whether slavery should be allowed in their areas. This resulted in the majority of the Senate voting power to now be in the hands of the free states. To correct some of this imbalance, the Fugitive Slave Law was also passed. It stated that law officials were responsible to catch runaway slaves and return them to their owners. Many Northerners refused to obey this law, and in fact, some helped many slaves escape through the secret network called the Underground Railroad. Now, when the fugitive slave laws were put into existence, uh, Southerners were ecstatic because what happened now, prior to, they were ready to leave the Union and possibly involve themselves in a civil war in, right after the Mexican-American War. But with the strict fugitive slave law, what this did was to deal with a couple of things on, on different levels. If you take a look at the bottom of the screen, the North, in response to the fugitive slave laws that had existed, had passed personal liberty laws. And what those personal liberty laws did, or what they said, was that any person 
within their state that is to be arrested has the right to a trial by jury. So in other words, any slave that would be, any runaway that comes into their state that would be arrested would automatically have to have a trial by jury. And of course, most of those people were anti-slavery. Well, you can see the result. You see down the bottom there, in the Underground Railroad, 20,000 slaves had escaped to Canada. And much of this was because the Northern states were complicit in their escape using these personal liberty laws to subvert fugitive slave laws. The new fugitive slave law was, was a little bit different. Prior to, only two states put themselves uh, in compliance with previous fugitive slave laws. California was one, and take a guess, you got it. New Jersey was the other. Now, with this new one, what you had were judges who decided. There was no jury, and the judges were paid for each case. They got $5 if they found that the runaway was entitled to his freedom, and then they got $10 if they found that the person should be sent back into slavery. Well, take a guess which one prevailed. So, with this new stricter fugitive slave law, you're going to have the abolitionists denounce it up and down. You see the uh, posters that were put up throughout various cities in the North. There would be riots in opposing this new slave law. Uh, one jail was uh, torn down brick by brick that held a, a runaway slave. Uh, and in response to the fugitive slave law, Harriet Beecher Stowe is going to publish Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is going to be the most widely read book in the Western Hemisphere, right behind, you guessed it, the Bible. Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, was an abolitionist. She was in Cincinnati, Ohio, when she observed as a result of the fugitive slave law, uh, a young mother being ripped away from her daughter and taken uh, into slavery into Kentucky. Now, she saw that and based on some interviews and, and what she saw in her own state of Ohio uh, was the basis for her writing Uncle Tom's Cabin. Again, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, had a tremendous impact on everybody that read it. It was for many Northerners, their only look into the institution of slavery. And keep in mind, uh, it was a rather shallow look because Harry Beecher Stowe herself had very little experience with slavery other than the couple of incidents that I had previously described. Uh, Stowe will become herself uh, an intimate part of the Underground Railroad. So she not only talks the talk, she also walked the walk. Stowe, during the Civil War, when she's invited, or when she, I should say, uh, meets Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln puts out his hand and is rumored to have said, so you're the little lady that started this war. Thus, so much was the influence of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which, of course, Uncle Tom's Cabin was banned uh, throughout the South. Now, a number of abolitionists were going to step to the forefront. David Walker uh, and his very famous essay, Walker himself, an ex-slave, uh, called Walker's Appeal, advocated revolt by slaves. Sojourner Truth, uh, who becomes an ardent women's rights advocate and, of course, an anti-slaver. Remember, she would sue uh, to gain her son's freedom in New York State. Frederick Douglass, who made famous the cruel uh, slave master uh, David Covey in Maryland. Douglas, of course, becoming uh, an international celebrity. William Lloyd Garrison, editor of The Liberator, Harriet Tubman, and then, of course, the martyr for the cause, Elijah Lovejoy, who we've discussed previously. Now, in the election of 1852, you're going to have Franklin Pierce, a Democrat, versus the Whig, another hero of the Mexican-American War, Winfield Scott. 
this election will prove to be the end of the Whig party. And really, this was pretty much the last election in which uh, party discipline across the country uh, was able to keep people in line. And what I mean by that is from then on, it was going to vote by section, regardless of who won. Pierce is, of course, from uh, New England. Now, kind of ironic that Pierce being from New England uh, gets the, the almost unanimous support of Southern slaveholding states. But that's because Pierce promised not to interfere with slavery whatsoever. Uh, a rather tragic footnote, Pierce uh, and his family jump aboard uh, their carriage to go to the train station to attend his inauguration when they will be T-boned by a trolley car. Uh, his wife and children are killed. Uh, he suffers a number of broken bones. will eventually get to D.C., obviously, to take office, but uh, his family, of course, will not. Now, the rise then of new political parties. The most famous, the American Independent Party, or as it was popularly known as the Know Nothings. It gets that name, of course, because their people, their members were counseled to say, uh, if anybody asks you, you know nothing, and hence the term. They were not, in particular, opposed or against or in favor of slavery. Their basic emphasis was going to be on anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. Basically, what you're talking about is anti-Irish, and they were nativists. German and Irish uh, were flooding into the country. This was the height of the uh, Irish potato famine. And if you've ever seen the film, uh, which I have a scene there from the Gangs of New York, this was really based on a lot of that. And nativism was actually, for the common man, the bigger issue than was abolitionism and slavery. Slavery was the sexier one, but the know-nothings uh, are going to capture a number of seats and a number of governorships. There would be anti-immigrants riots in Louisville, Kentucky, Philadelphia, and Charlestown, Massachusetts. Now, following on the heels, Frederick Douglass, the senator from the state of Illinois, is going to introduce a rather controversial bill. If you take a look at the map, east over here, west out here. In 1862, Lincoln had signed legislation trying to aid in the development of a transcontinental railroad. Now, in 1854, prior to this, all right, the idea was germinated to do the same thing. This is where Lincoln, of course, would, uh, would finally deliver on the promise. But of course, one of the things that would live here is everybody knew it would start in California. Question is, where would it end? And wherever it ended, that was going to create, just as the Erie Canal created New York City, that was going to create a financial windfall. So different people tried to get it in Tennessee, some in New Orleans, uh, some in St. Louis, uh, in Missouri. But Frederick Douglass from Illinois wanted it to end, and it's rather logical, right there in Chicago. Well, in order to do that, he knew he was going to need Southern support. And that he was going to find in the bill that he's going to put up, the Kansas. Frederick Douglass, the little giant. And this little giant proposed that territory known as Nebraska and Kansas territories, part of, if you will, the Louisiana Purchase, therefore part of the area defined by the Missouri Compromise as automatically free, that it should be open to popular sovereignty. Of course, the South 
loved it. And of course, again, all he was really interested in was building a transcontinental railroad. But by opening the territories to popular sovereignty, he will encourage the, the South to support his idea of Chicago. Emotions on both sides of the slavery issue once again rose in 1854 when a bill called the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed Congress. This bill repealed the Missouri Compromise and allowed residents of Kansas and Nebraska to decide for themselves whether or not slavery would be allowed in their states. The result of this unfortunate law was that settlers who strongly favored slavery and settlers who hated slavery both immigrated to Kansas. When these groups came into contact with each other, much fighting and killing resulted. Kansas was often referred to as Bleeding Kansas. Emotions. So, the little, the little giant has put his stamp on this. The South uh, loved the idea because that basically what it said was you can't ban slavery in the territories. Leading Kansas uh, is going to make, as you heard in that short film clip, Kansas a, a battleground. It was the, the Civil War preview, if you will. Battles, massacres, uh, and eventually, as you see there, it will lead to the formation of the Republican Party. The public reactions to this vary. As you see there from the South Carolina Mercury, Charleston newspaper, the North and South ought to unite in sweeping it into the rubbish of extinct legislative anomalies. Salmon Chase, we arraign this bill as a gross violation of sacred pledge. The New York Tribune, Douglas's new bill has taken the best of friends of the administration by surprise. So uh, there wasn't a lot of popular appeal to this, except, of course, in the South. Well, of course, eventually what happens is the bill does pass. It's now open to popular sovereignty. As the film had pointed out, you're going to have individuals flood the Kansas territory. Uh, Kansas being right next to Missouri, a slave state, uh, are going to have pro-slavery people go into it in droves. Anti-slavery abolitionists uh, likewise will go in there. So the battle lines have been drawn. Battles will take place. Beecher's Bibles from Henry Ward Beecher, father of Harry Beecher Stowe, uh, would be sent in there. Uh, fortunately, they were not Bibles. In those crates were guns to arm the anti-slavery people. Various massacres would take place. Uh, one of them at Potawatomi. Uh, there, uh, an individual who will gain fame soon enough by the name of John Brown will behead some pro-slavery people. Lawrence, Kansas, will see over 100 anti-slavery people shot and the town burned to a ground as the seat of abolitionism. Eventually, the effects of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, all right, uh, the Whig Party is out, and they will join with other groups from other parties and form the Republican Party. The Democrats uh, will shatter along regional or sectional lines. You've got Democrats who are the North against it, and of course, you have the Southern Democrats who are for it. And of course, the Compromise of 1850, talking about uh, popular sovereignty along with the Missouri Compromise, and then of course, Kansas itself is going to be voted pro-slave. Now, understand, uh, though this was pushed by Buchanan, the president, uh, this would not last because a rival convention would meet in Topeka, Kansas, as you see there, and they would issue a slave-free constitution. The Lecompton Constitution, which made Kansas a slave state, uh, was done with a sleight of hand. There were some illegal motions uh, taken by the pro-slavery people, which prohibited anti-slavery people from voting. So eventually Congress refused to accept Kansas in as a state based on uh, some voting irregularities. So 
So the battle lines have been drawn. Again, Band-Aid after Band-Aid put on the, the growing divide over slavery. But again, despite the various incidents that I've described, the average American was not concerned with slavery. But there will be some events that are going to take place soon after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which will change their mind. We'll look at that in part two of our lecture later.